Hello and welcome to this first video in a series where we cover a whole bunch of stuff and in this video we're going to be covering the monarchy on the continent of Europe and in the British Isles. We will describe the age of absolutism including the monarchies of Louis XIV and Peter the Great by responding to short prompts on flip video quizzes and we will assess the impacts of the English Civil War and Glorious Revolution on democracy by creating a flow chart graphic organizer that depicts the reasons for and the effects of the development of the rights of Englishmen. Here's the big picture for absolutism. The age of absolutism takes its name from a series of European monarchs who increase the power of their central governments. And it's another one of these ism words, uh, an ism being a set of beliefs or a set of ideas. And absolutism is the principle or practice of a political system in which unrestricted power is vested in a monarch, dictator, etc. So you're putting all of the power in a political system in one person who might give it out to little people underneath him, but ultimately it's his to hold, and usually it is a him. Okay, so what did they look like? Uh, they looked real, real fancy. That is a sword. This is probably made out of dead animals, and all of that is very plush. Okay, absolute monarchs. Oh, by the way, that was Louis the Fourteenth. Absolute monarchs um, centralized their power. They created whole departments full of people that just. Uh, ran the government and drew their power only from the monarch. They weren't independent nobility who had lands of their own to raise armies or anything like that. Um, and absolute monarchs also believed in divine right. Um, that was the idea that the monarch was God's servant on earth and subjects have a religious duty to obey the monarch. And now, why was that important? Why is that a useful thing for monarchs to have? Well, think about it. As a person trying to rule over somebody else, if you have backup from the church and from the religious side of things, it makes you seem a lot more legit. So Louis XIV of France um, did a couple of important things that we remember him for. First of all, he totally controlled the nobility using these two methods that are listed on this page. First, he controlled them using the Palace of Versailles, which was this beautiful country palace where he basically invited, but when I say invited, I mean kind of forced all of the nobility to show up in Versailles, and then he kept them there as a way to keep his eye on them and to make sure that they weren't getting out from underneath his control. But then also, he instituted this daily ritual called the Levé. I'm mispronouncing is, is rough for me. And basically, it was an honor to help King Louis get dressed, which is weird but effective uh, in keeping control of the nobles, and we'll get back to that in a second. But here's a picture of the Palace of Versailles. Huge, beautiful, enormous amounts of money were spent on this palace, as you might be able to tell. And he had all of the nobility living in various areas uh, within this palace grounds. So here's the daily ritual thing. So from 7.30 to 8 a.m., um, the first valet de chambre uh, awakened the king. And then the first levé begins. So doctors, familiars, and a few favorites, so people that the Louis XIV picked, get to come into his bedchamber and wash, comb, shave, and also help him get dressed and watch this process. Um, all of the attendants are uh, male, and there's about 100 people for this process. So he was giving out favors. Instead of handing out land or titles or money, which he did some of still, he was giving out these little weird favors for getting to watch him get dressed, which turned out to be a useful way to control the nobility. Anyway, he also revoked the Edict of um, Nates, Nats, which led to the severe persecution and exile of French Protestants. Remember, the Edict of Nats came out earlier during the Protestant Reformation, and it was great because the French Protestants were allowed to stay there, the Huguenots, but uh, Louis XIV revoked it because he had all the power, and he could. So Peter the Great was the next monarch that we're going to talk about. He embarked on a process of westernization because Russia was this country that was huge, had a lot of people living there, and very little industry, and not a great military. Lots of people, not a lot of technology. So he instituted a process of westernization um, where he made Russia more like other European countries. In Russia, this meant new technologies, a stronger military, new fashions, they cut off a lot of beards, new government structures, new capital, as in a new city, and lots of repression. So here's the thing. Um, Peter the Great, to figure out how to make his country more Western, he dressed up as a carpenter secretly and snuck off to England and the Netherlands, and he actually did a lot of research there and met a lot of other craftspeople and brought back his uh, technologies that he had sought out and found, new skills and craftspeople to boost Russia's industry and build up their military, and navy especially. So he also, again, the negative side of absolute monarchs, 
He built the city of St. Petersburg, killing thousands and thousands of people in the process because he built his city um, on the backs of these peasant laborers and then also named it basically after himself because that's what monarchs do. With all the power, why not name things after yourself? So here's the big picture for English rights. Political democracy rests on the principle that government derives power from the consent of the governed because they want to be governed. Um, the foundations of English rights include the jury trial, Magna Carta, and common law. The English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution prompted further development of the rights of Englishmen. So that's all like wrapped together and kind of awkwardly phrased. And here's the thing. I'm going to break it down into five steps. You got five steps in the development of English rights. First, you got the Magna Carta and common law. So common law was built up over time from uh, long, long ago in England where judges made rulings in particular cases and then judges after them looked back at those rulings to help make their own rulings. So it just builds up as judges look at other judges' stuff. The Magna Carta, though, was uh, a bunch of barons and English nobility coming together to force the king to accept some basic limits on his power, um, but it really only applied to the nobility. Then Oliver Cromwell, who was not a king or a noble, wins the English Civil War and king kills King Charles I. And see, he kills him, but he has him executed, not like on the battlefield, but like Gives, puts him on trial and then executes him. And there's a huge conflict in England over whether or not that was legitimate. Regicide is killing a king. So whether or not that was legitimate was a little iffy. Uh, Cromwell and then and Parliament then become the rulers. And eventually Cromwell kind of kicks Parliament to the side, but still. After Cromwell dies and his son sort of scampers off, uh, Charles II is asked back. So this is the grandson of Charles I. And he's asked back to the country to rule again after the there's some issues with the succession of Cromwell's son. So they do force Charles II to accept some limits on his power. So first Magna Carta, now these new limits after the during the Restoration. So habeas corpus is the right to have uh, control over your own body, which is really not to be imprisoned um, unduly like without law and a court process happening in the middle. Um, but during this time, political parties developed. The Tories uh, and the Whigs, which are two British political parties, which are split over whether or not to support the king. Um, then the Glorious Revolution, because Charles uh, has a descendant, James, who then's coming in after him. And unfortunately, James II uh, was Catholic. And in England, remember, they're Protestant after Henry VIII. And they do not want a Catholic king. So he's forced out for being Catholic. And Parliament invites William and Mary to invade England and... They do, and it's totally successful, and James leaves, and Parliament gains more power as a result because uh, William and Mary accept this English Bill of Rights which Parliament passes. And here's what the English Bill of Rights said, that no taxes can be imposed without Parliament, which had been an issue before where kings and queens had just set up taxes because they wanted to. Monarchs can't suspend Parliament's laws, which is always a concern with an absolute monarch, which now the English nobility were not. And no overly cruel punishments, like drawing and quartering, where you use horses to pull people apart. Uh, and Parliament should meet frequently, and the members are allowed freedom of speech. Because previously, uh, the kings of England had just dissolved Parliament when they didn't like what they were saying, and had imprisoned or killed people for saying something they disagreed with. But doesn't that look familiar? Maybe a little bit like what ended up in the United States Bill of Rights? First Amendments of the Constitution? Maybe? I think so.